everyone, and welcome to the Sustainable Finance Podcast, where you can expand your sustainable and ESG investing opportunities with insights from leaders in the field. I'm Paul Ellis, your host for these weekly conversations about developments in this fast-growing industry. My guest today is Georg Kell, Chairman of the Board at Arabesque, an ESG quant fund manager that uses self-learning quantitative models and big data to assess the performance and sustainability of globally listed companies. Kell was also the founder and executive director of the United Nations Global Compact, the world's largest voluntary corporate sustainability initiative with over 9,000 corporate signatories in more than 160 countries. Through his leadership, the Global Compact became the foremost platform for the development, implementation, and disclosure of responsible and sustainable corporate policies and practices. Hello, Georg, and welcome to the Sustainable Finance Podcast. Hi, Paul. Great to join you. Yes, I'm glad you could do this today. I appreciate it. Georg, in addition to chairing the board at Arabesque, you're a regular contributor to Forbes magazine, where you write about leadership strategy. And you posted an article at Forbes on April 11th entitled, Four Lessons We Should Learn from the Pandemic. And this will be our major topic for discussion for today's program. But let's begin our dialogue with some background information about your role as chairman of the board at Arabesque and as the founding executive director of the United Nations Global Compact. And let's begin with the UN Global Compact. Briefly explain to our Sustainable Finance podcast subscribers when and how that opportunity came about. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, That was actually in January uh, 99. I was then uh, working with Kofi Annan, the former United Nations Secretary General, a very charismatic and pragmatic person with an MBA background. (laughs) And uh, my role was really to develop uh, thought elements and actually speeches for the boss. And uh, one of the speeches I had the privilege to prepare for him was called the Global Compact calling on CEOs at the World Economic Forum uh, to take on greater responsibility in a globalizing world, arguing that power and responsibility ultimately cannot be separated and that it should be in the self-enlightened interest of corporate leaders to also deal with social, environmental, and governance issues and not just minimize uh, costs in the supply chain, don't pay respect to human rights, dump toxic waste in water and so forth, but take on proactively these issues. And it was meant just to be a speech, uh, but the speech made it into the headlines of all international papers. Uh, It hit a a raw nerve. And then the boss told me, well, look, now try to do and build something for real out of the speech. And that's where 15 or 20 years of hard work then uh, resulted in in the United Nations Global Compact as a network-based organization with more than 10,000 corporate participants, 100 country networks all over the world, basically through learning, dialogue, and partnership projects make a contribution to wider societal goals. And uh, that was the Global Compact. It's still up and running. It's doing well. My successor has done a great job. Uh, I retired five years ago from the United Nations. Uh Uh-huh. So now, Georg, during your career of more than 25 years at the United Nations, you also oversaw the conception and launch of the Global Compact's sister initiatives on investment, the Principles for Responsible Investment, which is now the UNPRI, and on education, the Principles for Responsible Management Education, together with the Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative. Right, correct. How has all of this work uh, led to your being a member of the board at Arabesque and now the chair of that board? Well, pretty early on, it was clear that corporates alone couldn't do it. They need the support of finance. If finance is not aligned with corporate strategies embracing sustainability and sustainable development, then corporates can't really act because they would be under pressure 
by inpatient short-term finance to produce only shareholder value in the short run, irrespective of long-term impact. So that's why in 2004, I had the privilege convincing Kofi Annan, who was still Secretary General then, to invite leading asset owners and asset managers to form a working group called Who Cares Wins? And that working group produced a report, uh, Who Cares Wins, which coined the term EST 2005. And a year later, we launched PRI, Principles for Responsible Investment, at the New York Stock Exchange. PRI early on became an independent organization, UN supported, but uh, now fully uh, up and running, independent out of London, the world's leading platform for big asset owners and also asset managers to develop strategies to integrate environmental social governance factors into uh, decision making and analysis. The assumption was always that uh, these externalities actually matter materially for investment decision makers. The problem has been that in the past we couldn't really measure it and we couldn't put a price tag on it. It was clear when corporates had a scandal or so made mistakes, big mistakes, they paid a steep price and then everybody agreed it's very costly to make mistakes, but it was very difficult to convince finance that it pays off to actually be sustainable, to avoid cost <laughs> in the first place. And that's where PRI came in and uh, PRI continued to evolve. But it wasn't until 2014, uh, just a couple of years ago, that the first empirical evidence was produced that indeed, you know, corp corporates, companies, which are good on ESG management, also outperform in terms of valuation over time, or at least do not do worse. Most likely there's an alpha in it. And such the first study came out by Arabesque and Oxford University in those days. Soon after that, many other studies followed out of Harvard and all over the world, Singapore, Hamburg. And uh, that attracted me to Arabesque in the first place while I was still at the UN. And I came to know the founder and CEO, Omar Selim, a wonderful, wonderful technology-driven uh, entrepreneur, who was senior banker at Barclays. He oversaw the European business of Barclays, very senior person who decided to build an independent organization exclusively dedicated to sustainability and empowered by technology. So converging the big mega trends of technology, digitalization on the one hand, including artificial intelligence with sustainability information. And that's why I joined Arabesque early on, uh, because their concept and approach convinced me these are the two big megatrends reshaping markets, digitalization technology, and the need to integrate ever more externalities, which so far were not really measured. That's the short story. Uh, and to me, finance, uh, the convergence between sustainable investing and responsible business practices opens up whole new opportunities for accelerating market-led changes to produce better outcomes, better social outcomes, better environmental outcomes for workers, for communities. And this convergence, I believe, is one of the most important trends we can see today, the, the fact that corporates and investors align, align around sustainability goals. Well, good. Thank you very much for that additional information, Georg. And our listeners might recognize a couple of additional names of folks who uh, have been members of the Arabesque board and joined you there. Robert Eccles, uh, formerly of Harvard uh, Business School, and Barbara Krumsick, the, the uh, CEO of the Calvert Funds for over 17 years. So, and of course, there are a lot of uh, very well-known people in Europe who are uh, engaged and involved with Arabesque's work as well. Right. So, so go ahead. Did you want to say something else? No, I, I'm convinced that sustainable investing is uh, the future, and uh, we can tie it now with the current pandemic. Uh, I'm convinced that the three big mega forces that have been shaping this uh, movement, sustainable investing, are here to stay. If anything, they get reinforced, accelerated by the pandemic. 
Uh, and that is, I think, very exciting as we look ahead, despite the depressing uh, uh, economic situation and the uncertainties uh, we are facing everywhere. Yes. So now let's focus our dialogue on the recent Forbes article. And let's begin by sharing with our audience what the four leadership lessons are that we should learn from the, the coronavirus pandemic. I'll read each one and ask you to give a brief explanation of it. How's that? Yep, perfect. Okay. So number one is human history and natural history can no longer be separated. Human health and, he and the health of the planet go together. Yeah, this is, I think, the most fundamental uh, lesson we sh all should learn. Many of us have started understanding that already in, in, in bits and pieces here and there, say on water issues, the connection between clean water and human health, or the link between pollution levels in cities and uh, diseases. So the link between environmental well-being and human health has been known actually uh, but we have never really conceptualized it as, as a really mega force that is fundamental for all economic activities. And uh, recognizing that the human impact on the natural environment is now so big that it's actually a geophysical force. And understanding that this, of course, has implications because nature kicks back, and this kickback has an impact on our very foundation, because we depend on the air to breathe, we need the water to stay alive, and of course, our agriculture and food production uh, all depends on it. So I think there's a really a new paradigm emerging that connects uh, natural wealth and health with human health and economic well-being as well. And this is a very fundamental uh, uh, lesson I think the pandemic has shown us how easy it is for one tiny, tiny virus to derail uh, all our constructions in the economy, all our transaction systems, supply chains, forcing us to shut down. Just such a tiny, tiny little thing can derail us. So I think it's, a, it's really a wake-up call to reflect on the relationship between human and natural well-being. Yes, I completely agree with you, George and Georg. And in your description of lesson number two, which is prevention is better than cure, you write, the pandemic is a strong reminder that ignoring science carries steep costs. Please expand on this idea for us. Yeah, uh, actually, friends of mine, uh, uh, the World Health Organization, uh, sitting on the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, for example, have long warned, as have other scientists, that uh, the likelihood of infectious diseases has been increasing because human activities have been destroying the natural habitat and they're forcing basically the animal world and the natural world to ever be more defensive, interactive with humans because the space is getting ever smaller. Uh, and uh, so the warning has been out, but the warning hasn't been really heated. As a matter of fact, in this country here in the US, the pandemic the infectious disease unit was abolished two years ago. Uh, just to give you one example, how we have been ignoring scientists and their warnings. On climate change, it's even starker uh, because the warnings have not just been out and well known, but the evidence is so overwhelming showing how the human impact, our emissions uh, contribute and cause global warming, which in turn has huge implications for everything we are doing and also in terms of economic practices and human health. So my point here is really, we have to learn to listen to science and we have to inform policymakers much more with scientific knowledge. It's in the end, Science is really the only good benchmark we have, a reliable benchmark. It's not always perfect because scientists themselves would admit that their discovery is a, is a journey of discovery. Uh, and all the mainstream good scientists would acknowledge that there's a lot of uncertainty and what they are finding out is just the best knowledge we have at this point in time. 
But this best knowledge at this point in time is so much better than our short-term political tactical statements of, of, uh, of fake news and misinformation. So the call here is really uh, let us make sure that as we learn from the pandemic, that the voice of science really, really matters and we pay much more attention to it. I would also hope that this will trigger off educational measures for youngsters to be more interested in natural science, to understand uh, how the natural science functions. It's the most fundamental thing we have. And there are great organizations out there that uh, uh, are trying to make the voice of scientists uh, more widely known. One is the concerned scientists here in the U.S. Great. I do, I do highlight them. I give them a shout out. <laughs> great, great. Now, George, you've mentioned uh, fake news and misinformation, especially at the, the country and, and, and uh, policy levels. Uh, that brings up lesson number three, which is that global threats need global collaboration. Please yeah. tell our listeners about this one. Yeah, well, it's it's a, a fact of life that many of the threats we are facing today don't respect borders anymore. Uh, a virus cannot be stopped at a border. Even if we stop all planes and trains and cars and we minimize uh, traffic, viruses find their natural way of migrating and they will find a way around the world. It's a global threat. So it affects all people everywhere. Uh, it's a global threat. Uh, similarly, climate change uh, obviously doesn't respect national borders, and no country alone can tackle these issues. I could go on and include in that list, as my former boss Kofi Annan did, he called them problems without, uh, prob uh, problems without passports, meaning they can just travel across uh, country lines. And that makes a very strong case for collaboration, for working together for having alert systems, for really helping each other. So solidarity is not just an ethical call, it's in the national self-interest. So my argument here is actually uh, quite fundamental. I, I believe that uh, many of our current paradigms, how we look at foreign relations, do not account for these global threats. We still think in the old empire thinking we have potential enemies, Therefore, we need military deterrence. So let's invest billions of billions in military. But that is useless. Uh, no aircraft carrier, no nuclear weapon can protect a virus or against climate change. So our thinking on foreign relations and international cooperation should waken up to the fact that there's a growing premium on collaboration. And of course, that brings up lesson number four, Georg, which is the pivotal role of the private sector. Yeah. Well, this is where principal hope comes in, and this is where actually I am uh, more optimistic, uh, largely because corporate sustainability has been a movement going on for over two decades now. Sustainable investing kicked in a bit later, in my view, it started seriously only five, six years ago when the empirical evidence uh, was brought up that sustainable companies outperform those which are less sustainable. Uh, and the two together now really can lay the foundation for the new markets from within. Of course, we see at the corporate level, they have the technology, they have the know-how. Uh, they also have the understanding and respect for each other across borders, because despite deglobalization and uh, growing protectionism, uh, we remain, of course, interdependent, and interdependency is a fact of our modern life, and corporates understand that. So they act across borders, not with military power, but by spreading knowledge, mutual understanding, and also economic benefits. And so I'm, I'm quite, uh, quite optimistic that the role of business and now finance is really uh, something that can counter any dark forces we may have at the political level, but also the lack of collaboration we find increasingly. Uh, and of course, the private sector also offers the concrete solutions. One example, currently pharmaceutical companies are collaborating in the race to develop a vaccine. 
usually they would compete with each other, but now they share knowledge. Again, scientists work across borders to share uh, the specific insights on, on the pandemic and how best to battle it. Uh, investors increasingly have the long-term view and they understand that the future that will evolve has to be more resilient. And this notion of uncertainty is actually something very serious. And therefore, as we move forward and we decide about investment allocations, we'll probably look for the safer and more sustainable opportunities rather than just looking at short term, uh, let's make a quick return irrespective of the externalities. So this is where where I think uh, a lot of good things are happening. And because the pandemic is reinforcing these trends, it's accelerating them and moving out of the uh, pandemic at some point, hopefully soon in the recovery phase, I very much hope that this agenda will become a mainstream agenda. Georg, you had mentioned climate change uh, and the climate crisis a couple of times in your comment. And in the article, Forbes article, you referenced the particular relevance of this issue to our younger generation of the human family. Can you say some more about this? Yeah, well, I'm a boomer myself. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> As am I. So are you, Paul. <laughs> but I really feel I, I have full understanding for the young people who are impatient because we have failed. We have really failed to put the economy on a sustainable pathway. We still applaud industrial era growth at any cost paradigms, thereby destroying the natural environment as if we didn't care about our kids and the future and the future they have. So there's a level of impatience I fully understand. The second one is the enormous, enormous debt we are building up now. Worldwide, currently already $10 trillion are committed to uh, counter the implications and fallout of the pandemic. This is debt the next generation will have to deal with one way or the other. It won't go away. It's the next generation and the generation after. So are we really acting in the best interest of the young people? Not always. Then the pandemic, I think, is just a forerunner. It shows us what a global crisis nature made can do on humanity, our lifestyle, and our prospects for safety and resilience and health. The next crisis, climate, is already well underway. We know already in many places it's, it's causing drought, it's causing extreme weather. It's still, if you so want, geographically contained, but the t intensity and the scope of the impact is increasing ever faster. So my point in the, in the opinion piece by and large is use the crisis as a wake up call for the next crisis. And in our reaction to the current crisis, do not fuel the next crisis, but rather invest in such a way that you mitigate the negative aspects of the next crisis or maybe even avoid it. And if I were a young person now, I would be so impatient, I would be so nervous, and I would be so angry with some of the boomers who just don't get it and who continue to uh, make policies and investment decisions based on outdated dogmas of the industrial era. That is, I think, uh, the bigger challenge ahead of us. The transformation towards low carbon economies, towards cleaner, healthier lifestyles, I think is already on the way. Uh, not surprisingly, young people have pioneered many of these movements, whether it's from healthier food to healthier lifestyles. Now, I think we have an opportunity to reinforce these trends, and we should really look to the young people to get the right inspiration for decision making. Good. Well, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts today, Georg. We can talk for hours about this, uh, as we have in the past, but uh, I want to thank you today, uh, Georg Kell, uh, Chairman of the Board at Arabesque, for joining me on the Sustainable Finance Podcast. Georg, tell our viewers how they can learn more about the UN Global Compact and about Arabesque. And how can our subscribers reach you with questions about these, this article in Forbes or the April 12th Medium blog piece that you co-authored 
with several other contributors affiliated with the Boston Consulting Group, Henderson Institute. That piece is titled Emerging Strategy Lessons from COVID-19. And listeners can link to both these pieces at Georg Kell's LinkedIn site. And that address is www.linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Georg Kell. That's G-E-O-R-G-K-E-L-L forward slash. Georg, any other links or addresses that you'd like to give folks? No, Paul, I, I must thank you and uh, Jeff Gitterman. Uh, uh, you have been a pioneer in that field. Uh, uh, alongside uh, Arabesque, I, I, I think uh, our journey has st just started together. I'm really, really forward-looking and optimistic that uh, sustainable investing, ESG investing, uh, in combination with uh, forward-looking lifestyles and better policy-making, will lay the foundation for a healthier and safer future. And uh, Paul, thank you for your for your for your never-ending energy on this uh, uh, topic. At some point, we should form a little club. You know, the boomers who who, who think they get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you better watch out, Georg. You may be asked to be chairman of that board as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, we will still be alive by then, right, Paul? <laughs> It's a it's a it's a privilege to be alive, Paul, and it's a privilege uh, talking to you. Thank Absolutely. you very much. All sure. right. Well, for our subscribers, please join us again next week for another episode of the Sustainable Finance Podcast, as well as quarterly Sustainable Finance webinars, which feature panels of sustainable and impact investing experts like Jörg Kell, and dialogue about important developments in the industry. I'm Paul Ellis, your host for these podcasts and webinar programs, and this is the Sustainable Finance Podcast.